Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. I believe we all agree on one thing, that America has a lot of needs right now. We've got a country that's uh, split on many issues. We've got volatile situations around the world that we're involved in. We've got differences of opinion on what to do with those things abroad and things domestically. Some way, somehow, we've lost our focus. Amen. And today I want to read to you the scripture that I read Wednesday night. Uh, I've read it before here a couple of times, and I struggled to find another appropriate verse, but I just couldn't get peace over not using this verse. This set of scriptures here, Second Chronicles chapter 7, what the choir just sang. Second Chronicles chapter 7, starting with verse 1. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, His love endures forever. Can you imagine the citizens of this nation kneeling down with their faces, with our faces on the pavement, giving thanks to God? Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. So the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their positions, as did the Levites, and the Lord's musical instruments, which King David had made for praising the Lord, and which were used when he gave thanks, saying, His love endures forever. Opposite the Levites, the priests blew their trumpets, and all the Israelites were standing. Solomon consecrated the middle part of the courtyard in front of the temple of the Lord and there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the fellowship offerings because the bronze altar he had made could not hold the burnt offerings, the grain offerings and the fat portions. So Solomon observed the festival at that time for seven days and all Israel with him, a vast assembly people from Lebo, Hamath, and to the Wadi of Egypt. On the eighth day, they held an assembly, for they celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days and the festival for seven days more. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people to their homes, joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon and for his people. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. 
What a glorious time that must have been. I'm not sure there's ever been another day, another period of time like this in human history where people were repentant and grateful to God for what he had done and humble. If you've been coming on Sunday nights, you know that since the beginning of the year, I've been preaching about the Israelites and their ups and their downs. If we were putting the, the Israelites in a, uh, a, a timeline, we could really turn that timeline into a roller coaster of their ups and downs. So I preached through the book of Joshua, and now I'm in the book of Judges. And we see a consistent theme. When the people were disobedient to God, God withdrew his blessings. And when the people cried out to God and repented, God unleashed his blessings. I believe it's the same thing with any nation on earth today. It's the same within the United States today. If we rebel against God, if we ignore what God has told us as a nation we should do as we learn from His Word, if we ignore it, God, ignore it, God will withhold His blessings. And if we repent and we follow the ways of God, then God will unleash His blessings. It's not a very difficult formula to understand. I want to tell you, I started part of this on Wednesday night, but I want to tell you what I love about America. I want to tell you why I'm proud to be an American. Amen. I'm proud to be a citizen of a country that has been a beacon of hope for the rest of the world since its beginning. I'm proud to be a citizen of a country that has eliminated tyrannical dictators from many countries. We've done that. We've not made any apologies for it. And some of, you, some of you here today felt the call to arms or maybe you were drafted and you didn't have a choice, but you did it anyway. You didn't run off to Canada when your nation called you. And maybe you, so those of you that, that, that gave in or accepted that call to arms became a part of this mighty machine that has rolled over evil through the decades. And I'm proud to be a part of it in a really small way. But our military is threatened today. Our military is threatened for several reasons, but one of them is that we are plagued with the high cost of fighting wars overseas. I read an article not too long ago about how World War II was just paid off within the last few years. These debts linger when we go to war. We ensure that the future generations will pay for those wars. Next, I'm proud to be a citizen of a country where I have religious freedom. Nobody stopped me on the way to church this morning to ask where I was going. No one stopped me at the door and turned me away. And religious freedom, now listen to me. This is the number one threat in America today. Religious freedom is the cornerstone on which all other freedoms are founded. Free speech comes from the American dream of our forefathers who wanted a country based on religious freedom. So free speech stems from religious liberty. There is, you know, there's so much ignorance over the term separation of church and state. There's just so much ignorance about it. I just cannot stand it when somebody misuses that phrase. I'll hear someone say, oh, you, you can't do that. Oh, you know, you know, uh, uh, separation of church and state. <laughs> you know, people just show their ignorance when they make that statement. Here's what the Constitution says. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And that's it. And did you know that when that statement was written, it was quite an original statement all over the world. Countries had state religions, and they still do today. It was a radical idea that a country could be founded without a state-run church or a church-run state. Yet it's worked all these years. But today, listen to me, religious liberty is on the cusp of being threatened. Free speech and religious liberty are close cousins and I believe that we'll see a day when it's against the law to speak out on certain things. It'll happen rather subtle at first. Here's my prediction. I've watched the news. 
I've studied this. I probably don't know nearly as much about all of this as some of you do, but I know enough about it to be able to share this prediction to you with some confidence. Here's my prediction. Harassment toward the church will enter our, na our national conversation over the tax-exempt status of the church. That's where it's going to happen. Wait and see. This has already started on a small scale. Uh, and you, you may not know it, but churches today must follow some rules about political neutrality in order to be exempt. Uh, there are rules that must be followed so that you get a charitable contribution statement that helps you out at tax time. But I believe this list of rules will grow until one day it will be clear that if the church wants to take a stand on anything, then the church will have to forfeit its tax-exempt status. Now, if and when that happens, I hope that I'm wrong. I've never hoped to be wrong about something in all my life. I hope I'm wrong. I hope years from now you can say, Preacher, you were wrong. And I'll say, Well, thank you. I accept that. But I wonder if people will quit giving if they no longer got a charitable contribution statement. Sometimes I wonder if that's what it's all about. I hope not. Uh, in the Bahamas, they have what's called the duty. They don't have uh, income. They don't have an IRS. They don't have an income tax. They pay duty on everything. Everything's marked up. Uh, 100%, 50%, some things like grains and rice, that type of thing, is, has a small markup, but most everything has a huge markup. At one time, the churches were duty-free, but according to a Bahamian pastor friend of mine, churches abused it until the government did away with it. But my, my exhortation to you on this issue, listen to me, is this. This is a political statement, but it's not a party statement. Okay? And it's a religious liberty statement that I'm about to make right here. You and I need to vote for candidates that understand the profound importance of religious liberty. We need to vote for candidates who understand that religious liberty is really the cornerstone on which all other liberties are founded. Amen. And listen to me. If you vote for a candidate that does not revere religious liberty, then you are aiding in the downfall of America. Now, I'm also proud to be a citizen of a country that has free elections. Anyone can run for office who has the determination to do it. I'll hear someone say, that guy, why is he running for president? Why is that guy running for mayor? Why is that person running for Congress? That person's not qualified. Excuse me? <laughs> All of us are qualified. If we wanted to do it and we got the signatures and we followed the rules, anybody here could run for office. It's just, it's just something that Americans are able to do that other countries just aren't able to do in the same way. You know, though, those who run for office, though, become heavily criticized, don't they? It's just part of the job. During, uh, during my lifetime, uh, I remember the criticisms of, of Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush the first. I remember the, the criticisms of Clinton and Bush the second and Obama. And, and, and all of these people suffered. <laughs> their families suffered because of their contribution and their gifts to America to run for office. But criticism is just part of it. I used to say that President Ford was my favorite president because he was only in office two years. <laughs> and when it's interesting, though, in American politics, how when the criticism becomes strong enough, the pendulum swings from one party to the next, and then the cycle starts all over again. And you know, in my, my short years here in this country, I don't recall any real peaceful time between Democrats and Republicans in Congress. Any of you ever recall, you know, picnics between <laughs> Democrats and Republicans? You know, we've been promised all kinds of things by different candidates, and many times they're not able to deliver on their promises because what they promise gets blocked by the other party. Well, I'm proud to be a citizen, that ha a citizen of a country that has free elections.
And I'm proud to be a citizen of a country that is revered around the world as being unique and different. There is no other country in the world like the United States. There is no other country that is as unselfish, as giving, and as sacrificial as the United States. What seems normal to us seems unique and odd to people in other parts of the world. I've got a friend that lives in England and he's, he's active in youth ministry development around the world. He never wanted to come to the United States because he had heard all, he had heard all the media stories about the U.S. And until he came here. <laughs> and now he comes to the United States every opportunity he can. I've got some friends in Germany. One of them was here just a few, uh, few months ago and he sat right over here. He shadowed me for a week here uh, at the church. He came to our church staff meeting. He's just fascinated with America as are my other German friends. And I, I went there for a wedding a few years ago and I did not know that I would become known as the American who came to the wedding. <laughs> the bride was from the educated class. The groom was from the working class. This was new to me because I, I didn't know that, st that went on in a developed area like Germany. But before the wedding, the groom's family had, a, had the wedding party to their home. And when we went to their house, this was the, this, the groom was from the working class, and so we went to a, a, a small home, and the, the groom briefed me a little bit before we got there that his parents were working class. And, you know, my response is, well, so am I. I mean, people, you know, my perception of it all was different. But when I got to their home, they treated me like royalty. I didn't know any, any they didn't know any English. I didn't know any German. And someone translated our brief exchange. We had lunch and left. And later, the groom told me that it was not me but his parents were proud that an American had been to their home. My friend told me that his dad went to work at the ice plant. He, made, he, he worked in an ice plant. And he said his dad went to work at the factory bragging how an American had been in his home. And now he had a friend in America. That's deeply moving to me because it wasn't about me. It was about this great country that freed the Germans of the scourge of the Nazis. And from, from time to time, I, I send them postcards in English, which they have to get translated. And I've learned that they've made a collage of all their postcards from America. And they show people who come to their home. I've also learned that all around the world, people hear news of America every day. Did you know that? Do we hear Australian news every day? No. Do we hear Canadian, Mexican, Argentinian news every day? No. But did you know all around the world, people want to know what's happening in America? Why? Because they still see America as hope for the world. And somehow, if they can just connect with America in some way, even if it's just through the news, they can share in that hope. Now, why am I saying all this? I'm saying it because if you are putting your hope in the military, if you're putting your hope in religious freedom, government, elections, and if you're putting your hope in Americans, then you are sure to be disappointed. I want everyone to hear what I'm about to say. The main need of America is not a better military. It's not more freedoms. It's not new politicians. And believe it or not, the main need of America is not a new Supreme Court. What America needs is repentance that leads to another great awakening. That's what America needs. Amen. There was a, the first great awakening around the 1730s when this country was just colonies. 
and it was on the frontier, there was this evangelist from England named George Whitefield along with other evangelists and they, they swept through the country preaching powerful sermons and this revival lasted until around 1743. And the results of these campaigns were so tremendous that that period of time became known as the Great Awakening. Now this is very interesting. Keep in mind, this is before the American Revolution. And interestingly enough, did you know this? That historians believe that the Great Awakening helped in developing democratic thought, aided in the process of a free press, and historians believe that the results of the revivals that came out of the great, that became known as the Great Awakening, helped create a demand for religious liberty. And all of this gave way to the American Revolution. So anyone who says that the United States is a secular country and was not founded on Christian principles is 100% dead wrong and ignorant of history. Then we had the second Great Awakening. Did you know about that? In the late 1700s until the mid-1800s, there was another time when America went through a long-term spiritual revival. This was known as the Second Great Awakening. Some historians believe that the revivals of the 1960s and even the 1970s were part of a Third Great Awakening, but others disagree. And I remember those times. I remember the revivals. I remember all the people saved. Some of you were saved during those revivals during that time. But I'm inclined uh, to believe that it did not create the Third Great Awakening. I believe that we became close, but something happened along the way. and We lost our focus, and we didn't have that Third Great Awakening. And as I recall, just I was a boy at the time, as I recall, the big issues preached about back then was men having long hair and women wearing short skirts. And somewhere, those, that, that kind of faded into somewhere. And Hutch, do you remember those sermons? All right. I guess you didn't listen to any of them, did you? Okay. Hutch didn't listen to any of those sermons. But you know, we need preaching today that focuses on repentance of the heart and repentance from sin and following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. These, these great awakenings, the first one and the second one that made this country so great were characterized by people who repented of sin. And this is exactly what we need in America. We need to repent of sin. Now, I love our country. We've got a lot going for us. I am cautious right now though. I don't believe that our American government as we know it will last forever because history tells us that no government lasts forever. Only by God's grace has it lasted this long. And only by God's grace will it continue to last. Amen. But while she's here, and while I am a citizen of this country, I want every single day to count. I want to drive to work every morning grateful that I live in a free nation. I want to come into this church every day and be grateful for this religious freedom, this religious liberty that was paid for with such an awful price. And while it's here, I want to use my freedoms for the good of others in this country and around the world. Let's have a prayer, and I'll ask our deacons to come down. We'll have our Lord's Supper. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great nation. This nation has survived the criticisms of the world. We're grateful that we've got a nation of people that others yearn to come, to come and be a part of. We're thankful that we've got a nation of people that are today questioning and maybe reading their Bibles more than ever because of our world events and our country's events that drive us to pray. Lord, we know that you cause things to happen to drive people to you. Lord, help us to be a people that comes to you and doesn't require that. Help us to be grateful every day for these 
men and women who've paid the price with their lives for the freedoms that we have. Lord, we take it for granted. We don't think about it as much as we should. Forgive us. Father, as a people, forgive our sin. We ask you to have mercy on us. We know that for this country to survive, we need a double portion of your grace. I ask you to be with our president and our Congress, our Supreme Court, all of our elected leaders. Lord, guide them in ways that they may not even know where the guidance is coming from. Give them unprecedented wisdom in the days ahead. We pray for our military that's all around the world today, standing up for the cause of justice and against tyranny. Please keep them safe and bring them home to us. And Father, during this invitation time that we're going to have after this Lord's Supper, I pray that you would bring people forward who need to know Jesus as Lord and Savior because we know that our ultimate freedom is in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. The death of our Lord was an eternal plan of redemption, part of this eternal plan of redemption for Christ to come into to this earth and to take our punishment for our sins and by dying in our place. And today, I invite all believers in Jesus Christ to partake. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26 says this, The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup uh, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, and as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All right. When we partake of this bread, we picture our Lord's body hanging there, suffering in anguish, taking our punishment. And as we drink the fruit of the vine, we envision His precious blood which was poured out for us to cleanse us from our sins. Our Lord gave up heaven to come to this earth for 33 years and then he died for us. We remember the humiliation of this awful mock trial. We remember the crown of thorns. We remember the terrible scourging. We remember the soldiers gambling for the clothes on his back. And and then we remember the nails that were driven into his hands and his feet and the cross as it was raised from the ground and dropped in that awful hole. And then we remember his spirit of forgiveness. As he was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. I want to give you an invitation this time to come and to see the only Arabic church in, the, uh, in Murfreesboro and is the only Arabic Baptist church in the state of Tennessee. This is the Arabic church of Murfreesboro. We just have a new building, and we're going to be the dedication for this building on the 17th of July. Come, see what the Lord is doing with us. Amazing thing. Come and be a part. If you know some Arabic person, please extend the invitation to them. God bless you. And you have a wonderful evening.